message from Goodwill and Pet. You're listening to BostonTreeRadio.com. Hello and welcome to the show Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke, and this is going to be my very last show for 2018. And I also am obligated to remind you that you are listening to this show on bostonfreeradio.com and WBCALP Boston, watching and listening on Summerville Community Access TV or some community TV station that was kind enough to pick up this broadcast. And to them I say thank you as always, or you're watching me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way you could join me, I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. And as I said previously, this is going to be my last show of the year, but not my last show, period. <laughs> In other words, I've got... Uh, an indefinite amount of time to go uh, for hosting this show. So, as usual, I've got four movies to review for you for this show this week. But first, I'm going to get into my first segment, which is What's Topping the Box Office? These are the top ten highest grossing films of this past weekend. Many of them are hits, some of them are not and may not ever be, but I will let you know what the difference is as I go down the list. And the number one movie for this week actually is not too much of a surprise for me, especially considering that there were no new movies in wide release that were put out in theaters nationwide for the last two weeks. So once Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse hit theaters, I knew it was going to be number one. It made um, actually less than I expected it to make. It made thirty-five point four million dollars here at home and around. Uh, excuse me, here at home and Canada, and fifty-six point four million dollars around the world. That's against a budget of ninety million dollars. So it's neither a hit here in the states or around the world yet. But it's in a very good position being number one at the box office this week. It may not be number one next week, but it's off to a pretty good start. The Mule. Directed by and starring Clint Eastwood is number two at the box office, also debuting at number two. Having grossed $17.5 million in the U.S. and Canada and an indeterminate amount all around the world, and that's against a budget of $50 million. So The Mule is actually higher up at the box office than I expected it to be, and it's off to a pretty good start, but it's still not a hit yet, at least here at home. The Grinch was number two at the box office last week. This week it slid slightly to number three, and it will probably be somewhere in the top five within the next two weeks, and it's doing incredibly well. This past weekend it grossed $11.8 million here at home. Against a budget of $75 million, The Grinch has so far grossed $239.5 million in the States and Canada, and around the world it has grossed $374.6 million, making it a certified hit here in the States and around the world, and it will probably be breaking more box office records through the holidays. And as a matter of fact, a week from today is Christmas, so it should probably make a lot of money on that day alone. Ralph Breaks the Internet is number four at the box office. Last week it was number one, so it took a pretty big dive, having grossed just $9.3 million at the U.S. and Canadian box office. But against a budget of $175 million, Ralph Breaks the Internet has so far grossed $154.1 million here at home and $285.1 million worldwide, making it not a hit yet here at home, surprisingly, despite being number three at the box office for the last three weeks. And around the world, it is a tentative hit, but we may see it certified at least by the end of the calendar year. Mortal Engines is the number three highest grossing debut movie of the week, but it is number five at the box office and unlikely to stay in the top five or maybe even the top ten by next week. It opened up to a dismal $7.6 million here at home and in Canada, and around the world it grossed a little bit more, $42.3 million, but unfortunately that's against a budget ranging from $100 to $150 million. So it's not even close to a hit here, at home, or around the world, and it's looking like already this is a flop, although I might be wrong about this. But considering its competition that's coming out this week alone, yeah, Mortal Engines looks like it's in trouble. Creed 2 is number six in the box office, sliding from number three last week, having grossed $5.4 million this past weekend. Against a budget of $50 million, that's five zero million million, Creed 2 has so far grossed $104.9 million here at home and 
$131.8 million worldwide, making it a certified hit here in the States and around the world. Bohemian Rhapsody is number six at the box office, sliding from, oh, excuse me, it's number seven at the box office, sliding from number five last week, having grossed just $4.3 million. But against a budget ranging from $50 to $55 million, Bohemian Rhapsody is so far grossed here in the States and Canada $180.6 million, and around the world it has grossed a staggering $636.6 million making it, of course, a certified hit here in the States and, and Canada and around the world. And we're probably going to be hearing a lot more about this as Oscar season is approaching. But this is one of the films that probably makes the proposed Oscar category of best popular film somewhat obsolete or at least unnecessary. Instant Family is still doing pretty well for itself particularly given its competition. It's number eight at the box office, having slid from number six last week. And probably by the end of the year, we won't even see this in the top 10, if not next week. But again, I'm not going to be having my show next week, so I will not know for sure. But Instant Family grows $3.8 million at the U.S. and Canadian box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $48 million, Instant Family so far grossed $60.3 million here in the States and Canada and $68.3 million around the world, making it a tentative hit here in the States and around the world. Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of Grindelwald is number nine at the box office, t taking a big drop from number four last week, surprisingly, having grossed just $3.8 million here at home this past weekend. Against a budget of $200 million, Fantastic Beasts, you know the rest, has so far grossed $151.8 million here at home and $596.2 million worldwide, which means that it's not a hit yet here in the States, but, and Canada, but around the world, it is a certified hit by quite a bit. And number 10 at the box office, sliding from number 7 last week, is Green Book, which you're also probably going to hear a lot about come Oscar season. And it grossed $2.8 million this past weekend, but against a budget of $23 million, Green Book has so far grossed $24.7 million here in the States and Canada. I don't have the numbers for you around the world, but here at home, it is a tentative hit. And it might not be certified, but of course, it's still doing well. Hey everybody, Rachel Ray here. Nothing brings a bigger smile to my face than cooking up a big meal for the whole family and lots of friends. But there's not enough room at my table for the 17 million kids in our country who struggle with hunger. That's why the Feeding America nationwide network of food banks collects surplus food to give hope to hungry kids. But they can't do it without your help. Support Feeding America and your local food bank at feedingamerica.org. A message from Feeding America and the Ad Council. Yeah. This is She Likes It Heavy on Tuesdays at 10 p.m. Eastern on bostonfreeradio.com. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing is Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, which is the first theatrically released animated Spider-Man movie. And it is having somewhat of a tough act to follow, particularly after several other great Marvel Comics movies that have come out this year, which were live action, including but not limited to Black Panther and... Uh, Avengers Infinity War, and Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse also is not connected to the Marvel Cinematic Universe that comprises the Avengers, Black Panther, Ant-Man, and several other superheroes. Granted, Spider-Man is a major character in the MCU, but Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse takes place pretty much in another narrative other than the MCU. But it is a completely computer-animated superhero film, and it is based on Marvel Comics characters, including one particular character I was not actually aware played Spider-Man. Because again, I, while I am a big fan of movies based on comic books, I'm not 
to be honest with you, a very big comic book reader. I certainly appreciate the medium for what it is, but I'm not one who's particularly attached to any sort of comic book characters. So a lot of people said that the movie The Avengers Infinity War what what focused very closely on the comic book upon which it's based. Me, I, I didn't know that. But in any event, I don't know exactly if Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse is actually based on a specific comic book. There was a, a certain narrative called the Spider-Verse that was created for the comics. This I know, and I'll explain more about the Spider-Verse later. But as far as I know, it is based on an original story by Phil Lord, who co-wrote the screenplay along with Rodney Rothman. And the movie is actually not about Peter Parker, or at least not entirely. Peter Parker is more like a supporting character. The real focus of the movie is a young boy by the name of Miles Morales, who is African-American and Latino, and he's voiced by an actor by the name of Shamik Moore. And Peter Parker in this movie is voiced by Jake Johnson, best known for being in movies like Jurassic World and, unfortunately, the movie Let's Be Cops. But that came out about three years ago. That was on my worst list of 2015. But I thought Jake Johnson actually did a good job voicing Peter Parker as a, as a guy in his mid-20s who's already established his Spider-Man alter ego. He's not like any of the other incantations of Spider-Man that have come on the big screen so far, the ones by Tobey Maguire, Andrew Garfield, and Tom Holland. In other, in other words, th they started out, all three of them, in high school, whereas Jake Johnson is playing Peter Parker <laughs> long after high school, maybe even college, although the movie doesn't elaborate upon what, whether or not Peter Parker graduated from college or not. But in any event... Miles Morales is a kid look, living in Brooklyn and feeling out of place at his private boarding school, but he's going there under the by the insistence of his father, who is a police officer named Jefferson Davis, voiced by Brian Tyree Henry. And he eventually begins to hang out more with his uncle Aaron, who's voiced by Academy Award winner Mahershala Ali. And when he's actually down in the sewers with Uncle Aaron, just doing some uh, graffiti artwork, Miles Morales is actually bitten by a radioactive spider, which probably was the same one that bit Spider-Man years before. And then eventually, something Terrible happens to Spider-Man, and Miles Morales actually witnesses this happening. And it puts the city of New York into a sense of chaos because now they don't have a superhero to protect them. But eventually, Miles Morales finds, after being bitten by this radioactive spider, that he <laughs> experiences a lot of superpowers, most of which he is not able at first to really control. And very much like the first Spider-Man movie with... Tobey Maguire, it results in some awkwardness, particularly around his private school where he's already struggling to fit in. So what I loved about this movie was the character of Miles Morales, and not only because this movie had the guts to make an African-American Spider-Man, not to mention African-American and Hispanic Spider-Man, but also to kind of go beyond the origin story that's already been done in a sense, three times with the live-action Spider-Man. I liked that. And I also really enjoyed the, the Spider-Verse. In other words, th there's a subplot, actually the main plot, which is involving this larger-than-life, literally and figuratively, uh, villain whose name... Uh, I, I want to say... I, I'm, I'm struggling with it, but... There is a large villain who's, who's... Anyway, he opens up a portal that creates a, another... Other Spider-Men from other universes 
who come into the, the main universe, and they include, of course, an older Peter B. Parker. It also includes uh, Gwen Stacy, who's voiced by Haley Steinfeld, who not only is a good character in her own right, but she also was bit by a radioactive spider and becomes Spider-Woman. There's also, there's, <laughs> there's a Spider-Man noir, who's voiced by Nicolas Cage. There's a, there's almost a, an anime spider girl. And last but not least, probably the oddest of them all is more like a Looney Tunes version of Spider-Man called Spider-Ham, who of course is a, a, a pig with radioactive spider powers, who's voiced by John Mulaney, who I initially thought when I first heard him was Nathan Lane. But there is a lot going on in this movie, but I don't think there's anything for which people who are watching this film are going to get lost. I think that the animation in this film is absolutely fantastic. There are a lot of really funny parts. I think that everyone who has a voice in this movie shines incredibly well. And Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse gets my rating of a knockout. It's incredibly fun to watch. I'm not sure if Christmas was the right time for this movie to come out in theaters, but that doesn't deter from my rating of this movie whatsoever. We are live outside the home of Joe and Rosie Goddard, where a pretty big tickle fight broke out just minutes ago. Sources say their father instigated the laughter. Let's go inside for a comment. <laughs> Apparently, they have no comment. Dads, let this be a reminder that it only takes a moment to make a moment. Call 877-4DAD411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Hi, this is Joanna Bremis, hostess of The Joanna Bremis Show here on Boston Free Radio at Somerville Media Center. Tune in every Thursday from 1 to 2 p.m. Please stay tuned for great music, first half of the show in English and second half in Greek. Thank you. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Mortal Engines, which is a film that I initially gave the benefit of the doubt. I didn't know anything about this film going into it. I've only seen the poster, which actually looks pretty cool. And the poster is so simple, too. It just shows a close-up of a girl's face, and her the lower part of her face is obscured by this, by this handkerchief or something, some sort of mask. And the movie takes place in a post-apocalyptic world where cities ride on wheels and consume each other to survive. And during this post-apocalyptic world, two people meet in London, which again is a city that's on wheels and is consuming just smaller cities on wheels. And these two people try to stop a conspiracy. These two people involve a young girl whose face is obscured partially by a handkerchief. Her name is Hester Shaw, and she's played by Hera Hilmar, who is an Icelandic, Icelandish actress. And there's also a, a boy from the city of London who finally understands that the person who is the mayor of London, Thaddeus Valentine, who's played by Hugo Weaving, is not as good a leader as he thought he would be. So the boy's name is Tom Natsworthy, and he's played by a young man by the name of Robert Sheehan, who is an Irish actor. So this movie doesn't seem to have very much in terms of story. It's, it's almost as if the story is there, but... As I was watching the film, I got it less and less. As a matter of fact, this movie made a huge misstep in the very beginning where it just shows a blank screen and some anonymous English person just gives you the exposition behind the movie. And it's only for about 30 seconds, but when I heard this guy, I wanted to say, whoa, whoa, whoa don't start the film yet. I have some questions. Like, for instance... Why do cities need to be on wheels? It looks cool in the movie, and I give the movie full credit for that, but at the same time, wouldn't that take a lot more resources to put cities on wheels? Are they escaping something? Is, is the fact that they're on wheels something that has to do with maybe global warming or something that is pressing for human survival? The movie never explains. Plus, there's nothing particularly obviously evil about 
Hugo Weaving's character, Thaddeus Valentine, other than the fact that he just looks evil. And yes, he consumes cities, but consuming them basically seems to mean that he, or rather the, the, the city of London on wheels just throws anchors on the miniature cities on wheels, takes them in, doesn't kill the people on these miniature cities, and doesn't really seem to have any disadvantage other than just being taken over by a larger city, which might not necessarily mean a bad thing. Plus, what is Hugo Weaving's character trying to gain from taking over these cities? The movie never really explains. Plus, eventually, the characters of Tom and Hester find that they are literally thrown off the city of London, and they have to find their own way in addition to defeating Thaddeus Valentine for just the simple fact that he's evil. And eventually, the movie develops into somewhat of a routine plot involving these two characters who you know you're, are, are going to fall in love, and you know that Hester is after Thaddeus for a reason other than the fact that he's politically corrupt, which I get, but I just was not particularly invested in this movie and I can't really vouch for the actors in the film either. I'm not saying that any of the actors are particularly bad, but they are just given nothing in this film. Absolutely nothing. This film has a lot of great special effects, both with the cities that are on wheels and also the vigilantes who fly in planes above the surface of the Earth. All that looks beautiful. It really does. But... I found myself not caring about the characters at all. The two main characters could have been killed, and I wouldn't have cared one way or the other. And, and uh, that might sound cruel, but again, these are characters. But I eventually found myself looking at a film that wanted to be Star Wars or The Lord of the Rings, wanted to be one of those epics, but instead ended up being the movie Dune, which was directed by David Lynch. Again, it was ambitious in terms of its special effects and the scope of its story, but it seemed so invested in these special effects that they kind of forgot to tell the story. They forgot to give necessary exposition, and because of that, the valid motivation behind the main characters was just kind of lost in the shuffle. And so I cannot recommend Mortal Engines. I can't say that it's a terrible movie, but I have about a little bit more time to discuss this film. Again, I'm not slamming the actors, I'm not slamming the special effects, but this movie left me bored, and also it vicariously left me disappointed. I left the film wishing that my the, the two hours of my life that I just spent watching this film, I could have back. Plus, I wanted to be more invested in the character of Hester Shaw. Hester Shaw is the one who is on the poster of the movie, where her face is partially obscured by a handkerchief. And for the first part of the movie, for the first 10 or 15 minutes, you see her with the handkerchief on as she's plotting to kill Thaddeus Valentine, Hugo Weaving's character. But then she, not too much of a spoiler alert, attempts to kill him, fails, and she loses the handkerchief, so you actually see the second part of her, or the lower part of her face. And it's not particularly impressive. She has scars on her face, and you find kind of out, you find out how she got those scars, unlike the Joker in The Dark Knight. But you don't really care, because she's not particularly scarred. I mean, she is, but she's not... She, the scars on her face don't make her less beautiful, for instance. And unfortunately, the scars don't make this movie any less interesting. So it gets my rating of a flunk out because this was based on a book of the same name that is written by Philip Reeve. And the screenplay was co-written by Peter Jackson. But there's nothing interesting here. This is not The Lord of the Rings. I recommend skipping it. <sighs> 
Steven. Who said that? Me, down here. Ugh, what are you, a yellow booger? I'm a banana slug, Steven. What are you doing in my room? I'm your sense of adventure. It's been a long time since we've had an adventure in the forest. Mom took me to the forest last year. I'm a slug, Steven. It took me a long time to get here. You're right. I should get out. Yeah, the forest is not that far away. Hey, Mom! Come to the forest where the more adventurous you lives. Check out discovertheforest.org for cool places nearby. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service and the Ad Council. Diane Wong here announcing a new radio program. Let's talk about race. From our beginnings as a white supremacist society to our current existence as a white supremacist society, race is a topic that affects us all. And yet we have difficulty talking about it. Why is race so difficult? Why can't we talk openly about white supremacy? Why don't we like to talk about white privilege? Why is internalized oppression shrouded in mystery? What about lynching? What about gerrymandering and the current Black Lives Matters debate? We'll talk about all of it. Come and join us Thursdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Let's talk about race. Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next, the next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Mary, Queen of Scots, if I can get the words out right. This is the true story, albeit probably with some artistic liberties on the screenwriter's part, about Mary Stuart, who is the Queen of Scots, and her attempt to overthrow her cousin, Elizabeth I, Queen of England, but eventually she finds herself condemned to years of imprisonment before facing execution. And this is a film that is fantastically acted. Mary Queen of Scots in this film, who is the, of course, main actress in, in this film, or main character, I should say, is played brilliantly in this film by Saoirse Ronan for, of movies like Lady Bird and Brooklyn, both of which she was nominated for Oscars for acting in. And I, I think she's probably going to get a nomination for this film as well. Queen Elizabeth I is played by an almost recognizable, um, excuse me, almost unrecognizable Margot Robbie, who I think also did a fantastic job in this film. Again, I'm not one to tell you what the accuracies of this movie are because I'm not a historian. I know some things about British history, probably not <laughs> as much as I should, but I am here not to judge this film on accuracy. Other historians can do that. I'm here to judge this film on how well it tells a story. And it tells a story pretty well. As a matter of fact, there's a great conflict going on here between Mary, Queen of Scots, and Elizabeth I, both of whom share the same father. And the, the, sto the story behind the reason that Mary Stuart becomes Queen of Scotland and not Queen of England is a bit complicated and is explained very well in the written prologue in the beginning of this film. But what works here is even though Saoirse Ronan and Margot Robbie only share one scene together, first of all, that scene, which comes towards the end of the film, is a wallop of a scene. And secondly, there are really good comparisons between Mary Stuart and Elizabeth I. For instance, Mary Stuart was raised Catholic before leaving England to marry a man from France, and she remained Catholic even though her father, Henry VIII, converted to Protestantism. And Elizabeth I is a Protestant. So there is already beginning to be that conflict between the Catholic Church and the newly formed Protestant Church. And that conflict is, of course, still resonating in Western Europe, particularly in Ireland and Northern Ireland to this day, which is unfortunate, but eh, the controversy still remain. There's also the idea that Mary Stuart can have children and did have one son, and Elizabeth I was infertile. 
She was known as the Virgin Queen, which might not have been accurate, but she was the Virgin Queen in the sense that, A, she never got married, and B, she never had children. And I think that there are certain poignant scenes where Margot Robbie reflects her pain and regret of not having children in probably the most subtle ways. There's one scene where she's looking at a, a shadow of herself, and she lifts up her shirt to make her stomach look bigger, and then she drops her shirt, and the, the expression on her face is one that certainly speaks volumes. And I think that Margot Robbie probably turns in her best performance in this film. Last year, she was in the movie I, Tanya, which I didn't think was as great as other critics thought it was. And one of my main beefs with that film was, yes, Margot Robbie acted well in that film, but I thought she was miscast because she didn't have the right look for Tanya Harding. I'm going to say it that much. And she wears some facial prosthetics for her role as Elizabeth I in this film. For instance, there's something that the makeup team did with her nose. It's not as readily apparent as the time that Nicole Kidman played Virginia Woolf in the movie, the name, uh, the name of which I forget temporarily. But, oh, The Hours. That was the name of the movie. But anyway... I didn't think that that makeup was entirely necessary, but I do credit Margot Robbie for disappearing into this role and turning in a really great performance with multifaceted emotions. And Saoirse Ronan takes up the majority of this film. I actually did think and was very surprised that Margot Robbie and Saoirse Ronan didn't receive equal amount of screen time, but they both made the most out of their screen time, albeit Saoirse Ronan certainly had more. And I, I love the dynamic between the two. I also thought that the last scene between the two where they meet face-to-face, -face, and at first that face-to-face -face meeting is delayed for reasons I won't give away, but, you, but you'll have to see it for yourself. But you're watching the film wondering throughout the most part, are these two actually going to meet face-to-face? -face? Were their scenes even filmed together? I, I suppose they didn't have to be, but fortunately, the ending, to me, at least didn't disappoint. There are certain controversies based on the real life of Mary Stewart, Mary's Queen of Scots, for, for which the filmmakers did take liberty. For instance, there are some scenes of sexuality, which probably are the reason this film earned an R rating. But I didn't think those scenes of sexuality were gratuitous or exploitative. If anything, I thought that they revealed a lot about <laughs> sex in the Renaissance times because you, you have to know that people did have sex back then. It's not something that was just recently invented for R-rated movies. And a lot of people tend to forget that. That might seem obvious. But in any event... I was not disappointed at all by Mary Queen of Scots. I thought the acting in the film was fantastic. The costumes and the set design were also very accurate. And I loved even what they did with the sound. Like, for instance, in the, in the Scotland castle where Mary Stewart re resides, there's a lot of echoing, which fortunately didn't take away from the important dialogue. So Mary Queen of Scots, I don't have a lot of time here, gets my rating of a knockout. I think it tells a fantastic story. It might have taken some artistic liberties, but it doesn't matter too much because it was a great movie nonetheless. You're not wired to have a response to this sound, but when we introduce a new stimulus, save the food. We're helping to stop food waste. Save the food. For tips and recipes, visit savethefood.com. Brought to you by NRDC and the Ad Council. From the hub of the solar system to the world, bostonfreeradio.com. Teens in foster care will love you, even if you don't know the lingo. Dad bod, now. The result of the occasional donut always washed down with confidence. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt U.S. Kids, and the Ad Council. Visit adoptuskids.org. I love those real six sides. They're the ones that move me. The thinly 
All this and more on Unpopular Music. Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and being the week before Christmas, I was not sure whether or not I would review a Christmas movie or a holiday-themed movie for this show, but the next film I'm about to review, Anna and the Apocalypse, has certainly given me that chance. It is a film that's credited as being released in 2017, or it's credited on IMDb as being a 2017 movie, but according to my notes, it was also released recently in the UK on November 30th, 2018, and was just released in theaters nationwide or close to it here in the States and presumably Canada. Anna and the Apocalypse is a lot of things. It's a comedy. It's a horror film. It has a bit of fantasy to it, and it's also a musical. And this is probably not the first comedy horror musical that's come out. I think there was one uh, comedy horror musical film called Fido, which stars Billy Connolly, but I haven't actually seen that. That might have been released in theaters, but I don't know. But Anna and the Apocalypse is a film that takes place in Great Britain in a sleepy town of Little Haven at Christmas, and there is a zombie apocalypse that happens that forces a high school girl named Anna, who's played in this movie by Ella Hunt, and her friends to fight, slash, and sing their way to survival, facing the undead in a desperate race to reach their loved ones. But they soon discover that no one is safe in this new world, and with civilization falling apart around them, the only people they can truly rely on are each other. So, this movie has been described by one critic as Shaun of the Dead meets La La Land, which I suppose it is, and I wouldn't have had such a problem with this film being a musical if the songs in the film were actually memorable. And that's one of the things I really didn't like about the movie. Granted, it's not something that really made me want to hate this film, but I thought it was pretty good, and there were certainly some laugh-out-loud moments in every other scene except for a vast majority of the scenes that had music in them. Because I thought the music left a lot to be desired, both in terms of the instruments that were used on the musical score, most of which were electric guitars and basically rock band instruments, and also the lyrics were particularly uninspired. As a matter of fact, for the first 30 minutes of this film, you're only given a look into the last day of school before Christmas break for these kids, and there's one song about these kids lamenting their life in high school and how they want something more after they leave high school. And then there's another song about a boy wanting to reveal his crush to a girl in high school and how he's sad about her inevitably leaving to go off to see the world. And these are songs that don't belong in a movie about zombies. Once the zombie apocalypse actually happens and these these people actually sing about maybe even killing zombies or surviving, that's when the film got a little bit better, or at least the songs in the film got a little bit better, but they still weren't good enough because to me they sounded like songs in a high school musical. They sounded like songs that were very dated, and yes, High School Musical was a big hit. It was a TV movie, but the soundtrack was the number one best-selling album of 2006, and no, that is not a joke. But at the same time, this is an R-rated movie, and I feel as though if the songs were able to become a little edgier or become a little bit more R-rated and become less about these teenager-in-love hang-ups, it would have made this movie a lot better. And I didn't have so much of a problem with the similarities between this film and Shaun of the Dead. After all, Shaun of the Dead was, I believe, the first film to combine zombies with comedy and showing how a lovable schlub who's not really going anywhere in life kind of gradually finds ways to 
survive and protect himself against zombies. That's kind of funny, and that sort of theme can be universally used in another movie. I get that. But I also felt like the fact that this film took place at Christmas could have been better utilized in the story. For instance, I didn't know whether or not this the point at which these kids realize that there is a zombie apocalypse going on. Does this happen on Christmas Day? Is it around Christmas? That is never really explained. Now, the day before this zombie apocalypse, there is a there's a Christmas talent show where actually the one good song from this film is sung by a character named Steph, who's played by Sarah Swire, and it's a sexually suggestive song about well, <laughs> about Christmas and about Santa, which is not exactly Santa Baby, but I'm glad she didn't sing Santa Baby because the song that Sarah Swire does sing is really appealing. It's really funny. And I, oh, actually, there, uh, correction. The character's name is Lisa who sings that song, and she's played by an actress by the name of Marley Sue, who is a who's a British actress. The The character Steph is this American girl who's in this small town of Little Haven, Great Britain. And it's explained that her parents are, are in the army or something as there's an army base nearby. But I didn't understand exactly why they went on a vacation and left her behind. That is a subplot here. And I also wasn't particularly impressed by Sarah Swire's performance because she reminded me actually a lot of Kristen Stewart. Not just in the way she looked, but in Kristen Stewart's worst films, she's very jaded. She doesn't seem like she's into the story very much. And that's exactly how I felt about Sarah Swire's character in this film. And there, there was a lot more that needed to be explained about her. I suppose Ella Hunt as Anna did adequately in this film but overall i just think anna and the apocalypse for the potential it could have had as a christmas movie and as a horror movie failed on both accounts it's not a movie i hated but i really did hate a vast majority of the songs in this movie and i do think that if you're gonna make a film that's a zombie film and a musical those songs better be about zombies and they better not be about high school drama so, Anna and the Apocalypse is a film that had brilliant moments, but it gets my rating overall of a strikeout because the music should have been what sold this movie, and instead, it is what failed this movie. <laughs> juice, Mom. Juice, juice, juice. Mommy, why are we going to the store? Mom, Mom I want Mommy. juice. Mom, juice, juice, juice. Mom. Your child will have different needs at different stages of life, and that includes the car seat. See, car crashes are a leading killer of children ages 1 to 13. Protect your child's future at every stage of life. Go to safercar.gov slash the right seat. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Greetings. Welcome to the beautiful Meat Club. Boston Free Radio is where you will find a variety of hosts that will entertain you throughout the week. But join What's the Word Radio every Saturday from 4 to 6 p.m. DJ Armado, Lady Scorpia, DJ Spritz, and Jono are here to bring the latest, greatest, real news you as well as great music welcome back to words on film the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures i'm your host and movie critic dan burke and i have reviewed all the films that i have for this show and by extension this year but don't get too sad um, it's now time for my next segment, which is What's Topping the Box Office. These are not What's Topping the Box Office, What's Coming Up Next. This is a spoken word preview of movies that are coming out in theaters this coming weekend, and considering that I'm not going to be on for the next two weeks, probably a little bit beyond that. And there are a ton of films that are coming out the weekend before Christmas, and even an impressive number of films coming out the weekend after Christmas. Because remember, 
We are in Oscar season, and there are several Oscar contenders that are going to be released in the next couple of weekends. Many of them are going to be in limited release. Some of them are going to be in wide release, but this is a really exciting time to go to the movies, which is one of my only regrets about not being able to do my show for the next two weeks. But then again, even film critics like me need a break sometimes. So this weekend, there are a number of big films coming out, and... I will inevitably review these movies for you. I'm obviously not going to do it next week or the week after that or even the week after that because the next show that I'm going to do when I come back on January 8th is going to be the best and worst of 2018. So I'm going to reiterate that towards the end of the show. But in the meantime, here are the films that are coming out in wide release this coming weekend unless otherwise stated. The big one, the biggest one, I should say, is Aquaman. And this is, of course, part of the DC Cinematic Universe that has hit the ground stumbling. But this time, Jason Momoa has his own movie. And he is Arthur Curry, who learns that he is the heir to the underwater kingdom of Atlantis and must step forward to lead his people and be a hero to the world. Now, a lot of people are really excited about this, more than I more than I am, first of all, and secondly, more than I would have anticipated considering that last year's Justice League was a movie that was meh, not so great. But I think that, again, very much like Wonder Woman, Aquaman should have been the movie they made before both Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice, and most especially Justice League. Because they should have done what Mar the Marvel Cinematic Universe did. Start to build up some of these characters in their separate movies before bringing them together for the Avengers. And granted, the Marvel Cinematic Universe did for cinematic universes what Roger Bannister did for the Four Minute Mile. In other words, they were the first to do it, and a lot of people have come after or a lot of franchises have come after that, but most of them have failed because they're too much in a hurry to catch up to Marvel. And that's the biggest mistake that the DC Cinematic Universe made. But I'm willing to give Aquaman a chance, especially considering that there are various other really good actors in the film, among them Amber Heard, Willem Dafoe, and Patrick Wilson, amongst other people. So Aquaman is a film I will see, and I will eventually review it for you when I come back to do this show in 2019. Probably the third week of January is probably when I'm going to get to it, but of course I can't promise that. The other big movie that's coming out in theaters this coming weekend is one called Bumblebee. And this is a spinoff to the Transformers series. And interestingly enough... <laughs> I am thinking probably what a lot of other moviegoers are thinking. When are they going to stop making those Transformers films? Well, Michael Bay is not directing Bumblebee. Instead, Travis Knight is. And Bumblebee is a movie about the other Transformer who's probably best known other than Optimus Prime. And it takes place on the run... Excuse me. It takes place in the year 1987 where Bumblebee finds refuge in a junkyard in a small California beach town. Charlie, uh, who is a girl played by Haley Steinfeld, who is on the cusp of turning 18 and trying to find her place in the world, discovers Bumblebee battle-scarred and broken. Now, normally I would dismiss this film, but first of all, you have Academy Award nominee Haley Steinfeld starring in this film if you don't count Bumblebee being the star of this movie. And also, John Cena is in this film as well. So, I kind of trust John Cena's judgment in the movies he picks these days, because he's no longer playing the tough guy that he ultimately did before. But that said, I'm probably going to skip this one, because I haven't seen any of the Transformers movies. From the clips I've seen of them online, they're pretty bad. I can't imagine Bumblebee being any much better. But then again, the movie does have an approval rating of 97% on Rotten Tomatoes. Does this mean we're going to see this movie get nominated for any Oscars? Maybe for special effects, but I doubt anything else. But, I, I, of course, I see a variety of films, not just the ones that deserve Oscar nominations. But I'm probably going to skip Bumblebee unless somebody really convinces me that it's worth my time and money. But another film that I won't skip is one called Mary Poppins Returns, which opens not on Friday, 
December 21st. It opens Wednesday, December 19th. And this is a sequel to the 1964 movie, which earned Julie Andrews an Academy Award. It is not a remake, and that's important to know. But decades after her original visit, the magical nanny, who is this time played by Emily Blunt, returns to help the bank's siblings and Michael's children through a difficult time in their lives. This is a movie I'll definitely see. It also co-stars Lin-Manuel Miranda, best known for being a Tony Award winner for Hamilton. It also co-stars Ben Whishaw, Emily Mortimer, and Dick Van Dyke, who is in the original movie, and my God, he's still alive, as is Julie Andrews, is also in this film. Although Julie Andrews is not in this film, although she could have been. But in any event, Mary Poppins Returns, I'm really excited about seeing. I'm trying not to get too excited because I'm keeping my expectations in check. But this is a film I will see and I will eventually review it for you. It's certainly a great movie to come out on Christmas time. Another movie that's coming out in theaters nationwide is a movie called Second Act. And this is a movie that stars Jennifer Lopez in what looks to be her comeback role in movies. Because we haven't seen her in, in movies for quite some time. But she still looks amazing. My gosh, she's 49 years old and she looks uh, in a way that 29-year-olds would probably envy. But it's a movie about a big box store worker, Lopez, who reinvents her life and her life story and shows Madison Avenue what street smarts can do. This movie sounds a lot in terms of theme like Working Girl and other movies like that, but I'm willing to give it a chance. Um, I do like Jennifer Lopez, and I'd be willing to see this film. 911, what is your emergency? My kid shot himself. All right, where's the wound? 911, what's your emergency? Please help. My, my son shot his brother. Every day, eight kids and teens are unintentionally killed or injured by loaded and unlocked guns. It wasn't locked! It wasn't locked. Okay, okay, Learn how to make your home safer at endfamilyfire.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council and End Family Fire. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and I'm continuing with my segment, What's Coming Up Next? And I've mainly been covering the movies that are coming out the weekend of December 21st through September 23rd. I mentioned previously Aquaman, Bumblebee, Mary Poppins Returns, and Second Act. Uh, all except for Bumblebee that I will see in theaters. The other movie that I will definitely see before at least the year ends is one that is the latest from director Robert Zemeckis, and it's called Welcome to Marwin. Robert Zemeckis, by the way, is the director who directed all three Back to the Future movies, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Forrest Gump, Contact, and several other movies in terms of Christmas classics. He also directed The Polar Express. Oh, and uh, Christmas Carol with Jim Carrey. But this time, he is back to doing live action. The last live action movie he did was the one, The Walk, which was a good movie. I, I think at the time I gave it a knockout, or I, I gave it my whatever my rating system was at the time. But that was mainly because of the special effects. Although looking back, the movie left a little bit to be desired, but Welcome to Marwin looks actually more promising than The Walk was. And this is a movie about a man who is a victim of a brutal attack who finds a, a unique and beautiful therapeutic outlet to help him through his recovery process. And I think that outlet involves maybe making a city out of toys. I'm not entirely sure about that because I've only seen the posters. I haven't seen the previews, but the, the character in this film or the main character in this film is Steve Carell. The movie also co-stars Leslie Mann, Diane Kruger, and Janelle Monet, amongst other people. And this movie looks really interesting. It's apparently based on a true story. And this is a movie I definitely will see. It may be one of the first films that I review for you when I come back to do my show. I'm, I want to say that it, it's probably going to be one of my, 
one of the best films of, of 2018, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. Again, I try to keep my expectations in check. I try to keep an open funnel about some things that are not Transformers movies. So I will let you know what I think eventually in the next year. And now I might as well get into some films that are in wide release or will be in wide release on the weekend of December 28th through 30th. And there are some big ones, including some Oscar contenders. One of the ones that probably won't be an Oscar contender, but still worth a look, is going to be Holmes and Watson, which stars Will Ferrell and John C. Riley as Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson, respectively. And of course, as you might imagine, it's a humorous take on Sir Arthur Con- Conan Doyle's classic mysteries featuring, I don't even have to say the rest, <laughs> Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. There, I said it. And this is a movie that looks like it, it was directed by Adam McKay, but it's actually directed by Eaton Cohen, who is an Israeli director who has previously directed such films as uh, Get Hard, 